Hello, welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Sean, and I'm joined today by Dr. Betty Kovach. Hello, Dr. Kovach. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm really excited to, to talk about your work, particularly um, Merchants of Light. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it is, uh, it's, I think it's what they describe as a magisterial work. And uh, I didn't have quite the chance that, I, that I'd like to, to dive into it. Uh, I was saying before the interview, we've got 500 pages and 40,000 years to cover. But, but I think people are going to get a lot out of this interview, Dr. Kovac. Um, so. Could you tell us a little bit of, about yourself and, and your work and perhaps what motivated you to, to write this particular book? Yes, well, I think all my life, that uh, conscious life at least, I was looking for answers, you know, what's this all about? <laughs> what's the purpose? What's the meaning? Is there any? <laughs> uh, is the scientific worldview that there's nothing but matter really correct? Or is the religious worldview that there is something meaningful going on? And what is it? So I always had those questions. And I went into teaching, I taught in college, and I uh, set up a course of mythology, which is really teaching of the spiritual traditions of other people. <laughs> and it was in the 60s and 70s. And it was very exciting during those times because students were kind of waking up to a lot of things and what is going on in the world. So it was very exciting <laughs> teaching uh, mythology and fairy tale. These are structures that are very symbolic and have a great deal to say about who we are. And so I just didn't stop uh, investigating the students and I investigated and I told them, I said, whatever uh, book comes out of this, I will always be grateful to you <laughs> because we work together. But then uh, there were events in my own life of the deaths of my mother and then my our only child, Pishti, when he was 20, and then my husband Ishvan two years later, and they were all three killed in automobile accidents. Yeah. And so that... Uh, after our son's death, my husband and I both had, we have to say, spiritual experiences, Gnostic experiences, direct experiences with our son's consciousness after his death. And that was the confirmation that I needed. So uh, I continued to teach and then I did retire early and I began the research because I thought, okay, I've been working with these things for 30 years. <laughs> Let me go back now and really go from the earliest time of our that we know of, of our conscious development and see what do our ancestors have to tell us. And so um, the miracle of death, there's nothing but life grew out of our experiences with our son's death uh, his consciousness after his death, and then Merchants of Light, the consciousness that is changing the world, came later and grew out of all of those, uh, the teaching and the research and experiences for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, talking about this this consciousness, this grand consciousness uh, manifesting and, and what's happening right now, but maybe we can start with the present and work our way back. But, but I feel like it, at this exact moment for the last couple of years, a lot of people feel really hopeless and they feel like we live in a particularly dark time. Like, should we have reason for hope? And is there something about the nature of consciousness itself that can kind of inspire this hope? <laughs> That's wonderful questions. <laughs> and of course, those were questions that I asked myself for so long. Yes, I think we uh, do feel and we are in many ways living in a dark time. And I think part of that is because of the suppression and repression of gnosis, of the experience of who we are for hundreds of years. And it was actually the repression and suppression by the Catholic, the Roman church that prevented science itself when it finally became organized in the Society for uh, Scientific Research in England in 1660, they knew that they could not study anything but matter. And of course, then they came up with the theory that there's nothing but matter. <laughs> but this has plagued us and, and hurt us for hundreds of years. And so I think we're looking this darkness of a global uh, takeover, you might say, and uh, uh, changing us in various ways, is that they're by people who don't know who we are. They don't know who they are or who we all are because that hasn't been in our culture. And so it's, it's an illness within the species. It is the same illness always is to, if we don't have that power within, we want power over others. And now it's actually grown to 
global power. I mean, it's a very serious illness in our species, but there's also a light side. <laughs> and I'm very, very happy with that because all around the world, and I really focus on Western civilization, people are exploring, they're having inner experiences, they're having Gnostic experiences, they're having prophetic dreams. And they also, for instance, in the near-death experiencers, I mean, millions, millions of people around the world are experiencing death and the spirit world, that consciousness beyond death, and they experience it as light and love, a love they can't even begin to describe. And these are millions of people. And when I was in the UK, the times I was there to speak at the Scientific and Medical Network, I discovered that in the UK, the psychiatrists are all, well, not all, mainly a very large number are trained to recognize what these patients are talking about when they're talking about near death and many doctors, medical doctors. So this has been a huge breakthrough that millions of people have experienced what they say in the UK, actual death experiences. And so, and what the experience of course is who we are, that we are profoundly spiritual beings here in the material world to create worlds and love and grow and develop and evolve. And it's so happy and joyful. Uh, it's ecstatic, an ecstatic Gnostic experience. So I think this is happening in, in ways that did not happen before. When I was in high school, I never heard anybody talk about these things. And I discovered Jung when I was in college, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist. I dated a Lutheran minister <laughs> who took me into his library and I and the ones I saw uh, books that fascinated me were about Jung. And so he let me borrow uh, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And I thought, well, that's what I'm in search of. <laughs> but he was a, such a voice for this culture that was trying to become conscious of the vastness of who it is. And so when I started working on Merchants of Light, I wanted to go back to the most ancient ancestor and take it through in Western culture and see what they could teach us. Yeah, well, let's, let's go back to that that ancient ancestor. So 40,000 or, or more years ago. And as I put it in the, the questions, what was it or perhaps what is it in the present tense that, that made us human back then as we recognize it? Like what changed in, in people's minds and souls that long ago that, that you know, continues the journey into humanness that is continuing to this day? Yeah, it's, you know, there's some questions we don't have answers to because we have anatomically been the same since 200,000. So why did it take 40,000 before we were able to have these Gnostic spiritual experiences that we know of? Now, we're probably gonna find a lot more, <laughs> you know, as excavations continue. But it, some people say, well, maybe it was only then that the prefrontal lobes developed and we were really able, but maybe not. Uh, maybe it took that much time for, for the elders or people to experience this altered state of our consciousness and then to model it or teach it or help it initiate others into it. We really don't know. But what we do know is that around 40,000 BCE, shamanism, that is the uh, effort to, and the ability to have spiritual experiences developed around the world, 40,000 BCE, as far as we know. And so Gnosis was the most natural thing. It wasn't someone talking about it and intellectualizing about it. Probably in their rituals, they had experiences and maybe some did, and then they began to model it for others. We don't know for sure, but we know that many of these rituals, uh, actually the repetitive rituals create a pattern of waves that flow through the various brain components and connect it, ignite it. So they probably stumbled on rituals that would do that, or they had experiences that taught them how to do it. There's also uh, the possibility that in the cave cultures, uh, 40,000 BCE, that they use sacred plants because we now know that sacred plants did exist and there's some evidence that they were in the caves. 
And we have some, there's strange notions about these plants, but when we think about it, here is nature that has, a, has provided plants that in the relationship between that plant and our consciousness, that relationship allows the spirit world to open. I think it's a beautiful thing, really. And so cultures all around the world used various kinds of plants and they still do today in many places. But um, there were also those, I talk about the sand Bushmen in uh, the Kalahari Desert. There were no plants there and they discovered a way to ignite that higher consciousness through dancing repetitive movement and dancing. And they say, we've been doing this for 65,000 years. And they experience Christ consciousness, or we could call it cosmic consciousness. And this has been, this is our heritage. This is who we are. I love how uh, scholars, some scholars say, we are all, and I know it's true from my own experience, we are all born out of universal consciousness. That's who we are. We don't have consciousness. We are this consciousness. We are born out of it. And as I think it was Henry Bagson said, but there's a valve that allows that vast consciousness of who we are to sort of trickle in so that we can say hello, good morning, <laughs> cook <laughs> our breakfast, go to work. Uh, and so the real technique for gnosis, for these experiences is to know how to release that valve, the triggers of how do we release it? So we see there are many different modes of releasing it. And uh, our ancestors did learn how to do that. And the Bushmen did and through the dancing and, uh, and they did it as a community. Whereas we know of mystics who sit perhaps in an ashram and meditate alone. And when they heard that they were, they were sad. They said, oh, alone? <laughs> Why would someone want to do that? Because they touch, they dance, and they can even manipulate this energy in a way that they can like throw it like a needle or a dart to someone. I just thought that was the most amazing thing. And I think we could probably do that in the cave cultures too, because you see uh, people floating with kind of needles in them, and you wonder, did they also know how to do that? So I think we have a lot to learn today. We know this consciousness exists, and we are learning methods of how to release that valve for the time being and experience that vast Christ consciousness of who we all are, and then to allow the valve to return and, and live our lives, our daily lives. Yeah. Uh, my next question might seem maybe a little bit out of place, maybe more appropriate at the beginning or the end, but, but I put it in here because, you know, around this time, you know, we're finding tools, we're finding, uh, of course, paintings, and we're seeing, you know, once we have tools, we have what we recognize as a science. So I, I think we can also start to see the roots of, of what becomes science all this long time ago. So that means I have to ask the question. It's very, very common nowadays. People see religion and science as being opposed to each other. Dr. Kovach, are they opposed to each other? Must they be opposed to each no, other? No, they must not be opposed. <laughs> in, their, in their full forms, they are not in any opposition whatsoever. And, you know, yes, I, I love your mentioning the tools. And sometimes it looks as though they're just for beauty's sake and other times they're for utilitarian purposes. But also what we now know is that these shaman mystic cultures developed and if they could exist long enough, they wanted the mystic, the Gnostic always wants to understand with this left brain, with his scientific brain, how does this work? And if science is rooted in the right brain, in Gnostic experience, then it, go, it tries to understand the universe. Now, this was cut off, as I had mentioned earlier, by the Roman church. No, there could be no uh, experience these were heretics that was that was no good that was useless and you cannot do that and so science couldn't uh, develop as it was trying to do for instance in 1600 these underground shamanic traditions you know would come up as i mentioned the five waves well 
the Rosicrucian era in old Bohemia was actually a gathering together of many of people from these underground traditions who were Gnostics. And they were from the Kabbalah, from Judaism, Hermeticism, from the ancient, incredibly spiritual tradition in Egypt and uh, uh, alchemy, which developed out of that too. So here were all of these people who had to be underground to continue to experience Gnosis and study it scientifically. So they did their best to understand it scientifically. And by 1600, there were some mystics and scientists. They were the mystic and the scientist sometimes were one person. For instance, John Dee in the 1500s, he was an example of that. But there were mystics and who were also scientists. And also this, there was this movement all the way from Bohemia in through Heidelberg and Germany and into England and that movement back and forth. There was a renaissance, a very exciting time of discovering spirit and how it works scientifically in the universe. So this was a great time. Now, it's by uh, 1620, the church caught on to what was going on, destroyed their papers, destroyed Heidelberg, destroyed what was going on in Bohemia. And again, they had to go underground. So that was 1620 and 1660, when the Royal Society to Study Science developed, they knew that their reputations would be gone, their lives could be taken. And so they couldn't say anything. We still experience that today. If we don't speak the official narrative, people yeah. can lose their reputations. We ha I think becoming aware of this illness throughout our history can help us to solve these problems, I think, today. But yes, there, there should be no uh, separation. And I think the Egyptians around, um, well, early on, around uh, 1500, and then again after Akhenaten, some of that was suppressed in spite of his greatness. And so Seti, one tried to bring it back and made it very clear for all of us what was going on. But their science was, it might well have been a, a really beautiful coming together of that ancient knowledge of the spiritual and the scientific. They may have really understood what we are still looking for. Yeah. So no, no separation, no separation. So you've mentioned uh, shamanism a, a few times. C can you tell us more about shamanism for, for people who aren't familiar? Like, what is it and, and why does it matter? Is it strictly an anthro anthropology, uh, anthropology thing, something interesting to read about, or, or does it have relevance for, for modern people? Well, you know, it's all in how we define it, because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a shaman, a great shaman, let's put it that way, would have had experiences with the other dimension. And we're always told the shaman lives on the edge of society so that it can be, he can be in touch with, with nature and also with culture, society. But a shaman is, should, should truly be, and is in most cases, a mystic, an, a one who experiences gnosis, one who uh, tries to understand the laws of nature. And for our ancestors, there was nothing more important than understanding the laws of nature they're our laws, and if we live by them, we are healthy and we can be creative. So in case the society forgot, the shaman was there to remember. And so he was a healer also. And he was it was his job to kind of keep everything in balance. Uh, the mystic can be separated from society, really. It can, he can or she can be sitting alone at home with mystical experiences. But usually if we have mystical experiences, we become aware that we're one and we want to do whatever we can to heal ourselves and others. Uh, for example, uh, Peter Kingsley's work with the pre-Socratic philosophers, which we just thought of as philosophers in the Western sense, uh, sort of rational minded people, they were great mystics and great shamans. And they were shamans in the sense that they were connected to a culture. They were great healers of people within the culture. And even were told a story that they were able to heal whole cities. They could see what was really wrong, but they were truly great shamans. And uh, Parmenides, one of them, uh, Pythagoras as well, but Par Parmenides very much influenced Plato, but Plato, shifted that knowledge into more rational ways. And we began to lose the Gnostic, the mystic, the shaman. 
But yes, it matters uh, whether we call ourselves a shaman or a mystic. Uh, it's in, it matters because we are vast human beings born out of universal consciousness that is love and light and creative. And our ancestors wanted us to know, and they tried so hard to preserve this knowledge for us, that we are immortal, we are all divine, and we're all creative. And so it matters that we know that and create out of that knowledge. And that's what the darkness today does not know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe the phrase uh, mystic Jewish tradition people would have no problem with, but I think maybe the phrase shaman mystic Jewish tradition might blow a few minds. Get, what does shamanism have to do with Judaism? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I received a letter a week or so in a beautiful book from uh, a person who described himself in London as a, a Jewish uh, shaman. <laughs> and what is exciting to know through the research of Margaret Barker, Old Testament scholar, is that the first temple tradition, and this is her words, was a shaman mystic tradition. Mm. And so here the emphasis was on gnosis, our experience. And <laughs> Uh, in the in the East, that's where the emphasis is. People in the East wouldn't speak of my faith or my belief. Either we know it or we don't know it because we gnosis is knowing uh, that experience. But uh, so the the first temple would it wouldn't have been strange at all <laughs> to think. But in 621 BCE, Josiah along with the Deuteronomist, who we don't really know who they were, some, there were priests, but they came in and said, all of this is wrong. Uh, they stopped the shamanism, they stopped the mysticism, and they, they eliminated the images of the feminine. Mm -hmm. And historically, the feminine has, is in every one of us. It's the heart, the love, the light, the spirit world, that which gives birth. And uh, so they burned, they bur she had, of course, groves of trees because the tree was so symbolic of life. And uh, both here and eternally. And so they burned down all of her groves of trees and they destroyed, smashed all of her beautiful images. And they got rid of her sacred text, which were Gnostic texts, basically. Now, many Jews took those uh, a text to Egypt, and they were kept underground. But uh, it was because of this destruction, and which then became not a, 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 a Gnostic or shamanistic or mystical religion, but it was more by the law. And, uh, and then it's very interesting because Margaret Barker shows very clearly how Jesus was the rebirth of the first temple shaman mystic tradition. So Jesus came as a mystic, as a shaman. And of course, the texts that the church saved and would only allow don't tell us that. But the Nag Hammadi texts, which were found later in Egypt after World War II, here we see a Jesus who is a shaman mystic. He says, I didn't come to save you. I didn't come to die for you. I came to remind you of who you are. You do not have to follow the Christ, but become the Christ. And so if it seems strange to Jews to think of it, think of shaman Jewish tradition, then it would be wonderful for them to read Margaret Barker and what she has discovered about their tradition. Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked a lot about uh, Margaret Barker uh, on this show. We've done a lot of programming on, on her and her theory, so I'll, I'll link some up uh, in the show notes uh, for people to check it out. But but if we could talk a little bit uh, about some of her ideas and other people's ideas and your ideas. But, but you know, King old, old King Josiah, he, he kind of takes out this, this mysticism. He, he kicks the Queen of Heaven out of Heaven. But... but as you said, a secret tradition remains, right? The, the texts, the memories, the worship, the embrace of the queen of heaven, the female aspect of God, these, these go underground for thousands of years. Is that correct? Yes. All of these shaman mystic traditions had to go underground. And let's keep in mind that the uh, pre-Socratics were shamans and they were active until the church made it more and more difficult. They went into Egypt and then down into Southern Egypt. And then with these traditions, many of them went over to Baghdad and then into Persia, 
during the high middle ages, they circled back, <laughs> but no, the church made it almost impossible for any other experience to exist other than what they condoned. And that wasn't Gnosis, that wasn't the inner spiritual direct experience with the divine. So um, that's, yeah. yeah. And can you tell us more, you, you know, you said something intriguing about the divine feminine, right? How how she, how it is, is the mystical consciousness. Is that right? Can you tell us just more about the divine feminine and, and what happens when we when we give her the boot and, and why we need her, maybe particularly in the modern world? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, in teaching uh, mythology and symbolic language, we look at a symbol and we say, well, if you look at the symbol, you can get a very good idea of what is what it is, what it means, what it's trying to communicate to us. But I would like to say too that these symbols and uh, and our true spiritual stories are not made up by the rational mind. They are actually structured by the organizing principles of the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And so when we study a myth, we will find it all around the world in different forms because the, you know there was the question, oh, is it carried by trade or uh, is it something in the mind? Well, I think it's both, but we wouldn't accept these myths if they weren't already within our, our mind, our psyche. So I, I really, Carl Jung had said that, I think he's absolutely right. And in my study of mythology, I think I have seen that confirmed that these, uh, these true stories are organized by these the organizing principle within the human psyche. So um, the feminine is a part of all of us as the masculine is a part of all of us. And as a symbol, yes, she is that vast part of who we are, as well as the earthly physical being with our feet on the ground. So she is a symbol of that. The masculine, uh, sometimes uh, the masculine was seen in old Europe as a mushroom comes in and goes out quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and in a sense, that's our lives. We do them, we individually come into the world, into time and space, and then we die or we go back to our origins in, in the spirit world. So that could be seen as a masculine, but the feminine from 40,000 BCE, she is the earth, the cosmos, the womb, the earth, uh, nature, and, and love, and that which gives birth, maintains life, and then takes it away and rebirths that life. So she was sacred everywhere around the world as that aspect of us as the Sufis say, the heart is the organ of soul. She was, she is that as well. So she's that aspect of us, which is that we, what we often forget in our world, in the Western world, because for various reasons, which we see with the Deuteronomist, with the Roman church, and then with science, which it wasn't the scientist's fault, but religion's fault that she was censored, is that we see with these restrictions, we've lost that sense of this vastness. So and what is so interesting is, yes, she is coming back today everywhere. <laughs> and we are discovering so much about that symbol of who we are. And I was so amazed when I was doing the research that in the 20th century, these independent scholars were discovering shaman mystic traditions that we didn't know about. And they were independent of each other. It was all coming in in the 20th century. And there were people who, well, for instance, Maria Gimbutas, who was an archaeologist here at UCLA, uh, and she had done a lot of work in what she calls old Europe. Here's this uh, eastern part of Europe into Russia and, and the Mediterranean. Here was a whole culture, and the feminine was really um, not dominant, but more uh, often uh, imaged. <laughs> we put it that way. It's a, not a matra. Uh, it was a matrifocal culture, she calls it, because all the emphasis was on life and there was such joy in these images. No images were found of violence. And of course, in about 4000 BCE, there were uh, Kurgans coming from the Russian steppes and they were patriarchal. These were matrifocal, which means simply nature focused, the laws of nature. And so they finally, after a thousand, you know, within a thousand years, they were relating to each other, but then it was destroyed. And we are 
the inheritors of the patriarchal culture that destroyed that. Well, just in the last century, did we even know that culture existed? Yeah. So we're discovering so much. And I think that this light is becoming much stronger for many, many people, the light and the consciousness, because they are experiencing it. Yeah, and I, I, I hope so. I've, I've experienced it myself, met other people who have experienced it, and, and I, I hope that light keeps keeps flowing. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, the Rosicrucians, uh, and you mentioned the the five waves of waves of remembering. Can you tell us, you know, each a, a little bit about these five waves, about these historical developments? Uh, you know, what they were around when they happened, why why they matter? Yes. Okay. Well, the, let's say after the Deuteronomist, after Jesus, after the early Christians, then by in the fourth century, the Roman Church took over. Christianity became legal and the only religion. And uh, so there was a suppression and a repression of anything else. The ancient uh, traditions that were still alive were absolutely throttled. I mean, they could not exist. And there was tremendous murder. Mass numbers of people were murdered who didn't go along with it. Texts were burned of every tradition and every underground tradition, they were burned. And it, it was a time of real destruction. And so there was this, everything kind of went underground to survive, you know? And 700 years later in the high middle ages, mystic Christianity emerged like a phoenix out of the fire, especially at Chartres, in France and in, in Germany too, and in Europe with the Parsifal legends. But this is very important that there was such a, um, a restriction for so long. And of course, there was no feminine other than Mary. There was Mary, she wasn't divine, but she was the mother of, you try, have to figure that one out. But at any rate, 700 years later, this just emerged, the feminine emerged it even changed the nature of the, of the of chess, and men even were kind of wearing women's clothing a little bit. There was just absolute need for the feminine, and the feminine in the Parsifal stories. I mean, she was there. I mean, in all of the stories, it was an attempt to to bring the feminine back. Who is the feminine? What is she? And one story that gives a really good insight into that is um, that I think it was Gawain uh, married is beautiful woman i mean absolutely beautiful woman but then when they were alone at night she became a horrible old ugly hag and she said to him i can be this with you at night or i can be the beautiful woman with you at night and the hag at court it's what what do you want and he has caught on. <laughs> the masculine is, of that time is educated. And he said, that is a choice for you to make. Yeah. And she becomes the beautiful woman everywhere at every time. And I think this is what these many, many stories are trying to teach us is that we have suppressed, we had suppressed what is the feminine? She had no rights, no place, and no one knew anything about it and who cared. And so, and then, Gradually, they saw that they were all King Arthur's court. There we see them all at the round table, a completeness, a wholeness. And in the middle is the grail, which is certainly the symbol of soul, of the feminine giving birth always. And so they all streak out into the woods <laughs> to find the grail because each of them has to find their way and they meet the feminine all the way through. So after 700 years, now that was the Parsifal stories, but what most of us didn't know was that at 1000, uh, at Chartres, uh, there was this incredible flowering of the secret tradition that Jesus taught of Gnosticism. And we, the story is, I think it's wonderful, that uh, during Paul's life, during the time that he was preaching, that he went to Athens and there was a man there, Dionysus Areopagite, heard him and he said, Paul came into Athens like a fiery spirit. And he taught, of course, the experience on the road to Damascus. He taught Gnostic 
Christianity. Yeah. And so he and uh, Paul, uh, Dionysus Areopagite and Paul became friends. Paul took mystic Christianity into the Mediterranean and Dionysus it went, in, it went into Europe and Athens in Europe. And many people wrote his works. It was called pseudo Dionysus, but it wasn't. It was Dionysus's work and it was in Northern France. And that had filtered down uh, into during the Middle Ages to Chartres. What developed there around 1000 was Gnostic Christianity. And uh, the great teachers, they taught the rational world, but they also, everything had to do with giving birth to the higher self. And the Mary mysteries, they were called, is precisely giving birth to that larger self. It was that it was Gnostic Christianity, full bloom. Of course, once a church found out what was going on, it was done in, but uh, it was just an incredible happening. Then, and you know, one of the things that I uh, mentioned in the book, which I think is a wonderful symbol of that time, is that the painters were often uh, painting the Annunciation. But if we look at it from the perspective of Gnosis, here is Mary and an angel comes, and usually there's a bright light coming from the cosmos into Mary and he is announcing that she will give birth to the Messiah, which is cosmic consciousness. That is symbolic. We can look at it on that level, but, Mary, but that's symbolic of cosmic consciousness being born in the human being. That was in the Middle Ages, and it continued into the Italian Renaissance, which is the second wave of remembering. And this was a Renaissance in which everything was opening up, you know, in the physical world. But there was also this, for instance, Pico was uh, Della Marandola. He was an exceptionally, just an exceptional person. Uh, and he really saw the underground traditions and Christianity as one. And he was young, brilliant, naive. And so he decided, okay, I'm going to have a conference with all of these, the great leaders of all of these traditions in Rome. And he wrote up the theses, I think it was 900 theses, brilliant, he was in his 20s, and had it printed in Rome. Whoops, yeah. <laughs> the Pope, <laughs> nope, you cannot print it, you will not have the conference, and he put Pico in jail. Yeah. And this is I was what say brilliant, but maybe a bit naive, uh, as you mentioned, you know, I, I, he, he really believed, you know, he really thought it, okay, I can have this conference and, you know, people will just see, right? They, they'll have a Gnostic experience just being exposed to this knowledge. I, I, I think he really believed that. And he really wanted people to see with uh, Kabbalah what, yeah. what they were saying or alchemy. Uh, but he was destroyed when he was very young. And, but... That was a second wave of remembering. So mm -hmm. Kabbalah and uh, alchemy were just trying to get into the surface of consciousness, kind of went underground. And then it was Francis Yates working at the Warburg Institute who discovered the Rosicrucian enlightenment. We knew nothing about it until the 20th century when she discovered. We didn't even know these scientists, mystics were working in Bohemia or Heidelberg, or that they had the connection with London, that there was this wonderful movement. We didn't know that. And she shows us, here is the third wave of remembering. And these uh, underground traditions came together under Rudolf, who was a Catholic, but he was open to these things. So there they were working together. What a wonderful time and renaissance. Well, when the church found out, they destroyed everything they could. But that went underground too. And then, uh, Goethe and many of the classical writers and romantic writers in Germany, but especially Goethe. Goethe went to the university, his father wanted him to study law. There was nothing in it for him. And so his mother understood, he came home sick and his mother got him in touch with a pietist who was an alchemist, who was what that Rosicrucian tradition was all about. And it's how to become who we are. Novalis was in the same condition. He found Goethe and he understood. And so the two of them, well, actually they were both independently saying, we want a new, we will create a new mythology, which really means the old mythology of the secret tradition that Jesus taught of becoming our whole selves, who we potentially are in cosmic consciousness. And uh, so that was the fifth, the fourth wave of remembering. Yeah. And today is the fifth. I think never has it been so widespread as today. 
and it's exciting and it's it's very very important that we do not let this die because and i'll try to say this very quickly it's very <laughs> a little mm. bit complicated but when a culture uh really advances in uh the spiritual because the west had already nurtured the uh, physical the literal so we have the left brain rationality and then the right brain in touch with the heart and spirituality if those get pulled too far apart in a culture let's say it that this develops as it did in europe and then it's submerged again then these opposites are are dissociated and here was germany which was deeply involved in the spiritual had was able to reject the french enlightenment philosophers are saying there's nothing everything that came before is nonsense uh rational consciousness is what it is and we the apex of it no they could say no to them but by the 20th century they fell into national socialism it's a danger we need to be very very aware of that when these two endeavors are pulled too far apart and we're kind of there today i think you know we really this time is the fifth time we really must allow uh, this uh, this cosmic consciousness to be integrated yeah um so that would be a perfect place to end but i just i have one final question to to uh to ruin that 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 call to action but uh one, one that i'm curious about because you know the 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 heresy hunters wrote about the ancient Gnostics and that that's how we actually, you know, knew a lot about them until we found the non Kavadi. And, and one of these heresy hunters wrote that the Gnostics believed that divine energy went up and down the spine like a snake. So I thought that was very interesting. So, you know, you, you have an appendix, you mentioned something called the Kundalini. What What is the Kundalini? Well, you know, that's a word that came from the East. Uh, the San Bushmen have their own word for that, of that energy that when when let's say when they danced and danced or when we meditate or whatever we do that opens us up to that universal energy that many people experiencing it as a movement from the very base of the spine all the way up to the uh, third eye and then the the crown chakra and so that was uh called kundalini the serpent and but in in not just in india but in europe too when you see the goddess you would see the serpent with her because she would initiate that process shakti is also feminine in indian uh, philosophy or or spirituality so kundalini is simply uh, the serpent or it's an image for that rising energy from the base of the spine through the crown chakra which connects us to cosmic consciousness. And it's interesting because the feminine always was connected to that. But when the Deuteronomists inverted our true story, they made the feminine very evil and have an evil connection to the serpent. But that is all false and fraudulent. The true story is that she gives, she is the tree that gives the energy of Kundalini to anyone who seeks it. Well, I, I you know, I. I could talk to you all day, but uh, you probably have a life. I know that you have a life, <laughs> a life that you have to get out there and live. So, uh, but but it's been really awesome talking to you, uh, Dr. Kovach. So, so people watching at home, I, I've been throwing up uh, an address online. People also listen to this as a po as a podcast, but it's comlock.com. Can you can you tell us about the Comlock Center and, and why people should go to comlock.com? Well, uh, it's a website mm -hmm. uh, that I have. I, there are the uh, videos. Many of the videos are there, the podcasts, the webinars and articles. And people can buy books from there, too, from the Comlock Center. And uh, if they want to join the newsletter, sign up for the newsletter, they will get a chapter of uh, Merchants of Light. So it's a it's a virtual center because <laughs> so much is today. Right. Yeah. But it has all of those things and available. Wonderful. Well, to wrap up, uh, I'll tell people out there, get a copy of Merchants of Light, as well as uh, Dr. Kovacs' other books. I'll quickly plug our uh, our uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic or paypal.me slash Gnostic. Uh, donations is what keeps us going. You get early access to shows. Any amount helps. And if you can't help us out financially, I understand. Just uh, tell people about the show. Send them this episode. They'll love it. So uh, thanks so much, Dr. Kovacs. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on maybe again sometime. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah, so uh, farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much.